Good afternoon, and welcome to Of Mice and Men Theater, where we bring you the best of mice and men all the time. Mice and men 24-7. Actually, not 24-7. We are on page 47, and we are in the middle of chapter 3. So as you might recall, they are sitting around the bunkhouse. George had a quiet moment with Slim, where George was able to tell Slim all about what Lenny did in Weed. Lenny got the new pup. Wit came in, and Wit was kind of being a distraction because Carlson wants to shoot Candy's dog. And uh, Candy doesn't want to shoot his dog because it's his buddy, it's his friend. And so now we're on page 47, and Wit was talking about the magazine, and it was kind of meant to be this distraction. Uh, but it doesn't work. So page 47, right in the middle of the page. During the conversation, Carlson had refused to be drawn in. He continued to look down at the old dog. Candy watched him uneasily. At last, Carlson said, If you want me to, I'll put the old devil out of his misery right now and get it over with. Ain't nothing left for him. Can't eat, can't see. Can't even walk without hurting. Candy said hopefully, You ain't got no gun. The hell I ain't. Got a luger. It won't hurt him none at all. Candy said, Maybe tomorrow. Let's wait till tomorrow. I don't see no reason for it, said Carlson. He went to his bunk, pulled his bag from underneath it, and took out a luger pistol. Let's get it over with, he said. We can't sleep with him stinking all around here. He put the pistol in his hip pocket. Candy looked a long time at Slim to try and find some reversal, and Slim gave him none. At last, Candy said softly and hopelessly, All right, take him. He did not look down at the dog at all. He lay back on his bunk, and crossed his arms behind his head and stared at the ceiling. From his pocket, Carlson took a little leather thong. He stooped over and tied it around the old dog's neck. All the men except Candy watched him. Come, boy. Come on, boy, he said gently. And he said apologetically to Candy, He won't even feel it. Candy did not move nor answer him. He twitched the thong. Come on, boy. The old dog slowly got up stiffly to his feet and followed the gently pulling leash. Slim said, Carlson. Yeah. You know what to do. What you mean, Slim? Take a shovel, said Slim shortly. Oh, sure, I get you. He led the dog out into the darkness. George followed to the door and shut the door and set the latch gently in its place. Candy lay rigidly on his bed, staring at the ceiling. Slim said loudly, One of my lead mules got a bad hoof. Got to get some tar on it. His voice trailed off. It was silent outside. Carlson's footsteps died away. Silence came into the room, and the silence lasted. George chuckled. <laughs> uh, I bet Lenny's right out there in the barn with his pup. He won't want to come in here no more, now he's got a pup. Slim said, Candy, you can have any one of them pups you want. Candy did not answer. The silence fell on the room again. came out of the night and invaded the room. George said, anybody like to play a little euchre? Now I'll play a few with you, said Wit. They took places opposite each other at the table under the light, but George did not shuffle the cards. He rippled the edge of the deck nervously and the little snapping noise drew the eyes of all the men in the room, 
so that he stopped doing it. The silence fell on the room again. A minute passed. Another minute. Candy lay still, staring at the ceiling. Slim gazed at him for a moment and then looked down on his hands. He subdued one hand with the other and held it down. There came a little gnawing sound from under the floor, and all the men looked down toward it gratefully. Only Candy continued to stare at the ceiling. Sounds like there was a rat under there, said George. We ought to get a trap down there. Wit broke out. What the hell's taking him so long? Lay out some cards, why don't you? We ain't going to get no euchre played this way. George brought the cards together tightly and studied the backs of them. The silence was in the room again. A shot sounded in the distance. The men looked quickly at the old man. Every head turned toward him. For a moment, he continued to stare at the ceiling. Then he rolled slowly over and faced the wall and lay silent. George shuffled the cards noisily and dealt them. Wit drew a scoring board to him and set the pegs to start. Wit said, I guess you guys really come here to work. What do you mean? George asked. Wit laughed. <laughs> well, you come on a Friday. You gotta work two days till Sunday. I don't see how you figure, said George. Wit laughed again. <laughs> you do if you've been around these big ranches much. Guy that wants to look over a ranch comes in Saturday afternoon. You get Saturday night supper and three meals on Sunday, and he can quit Monday morning after breakfast without turning his hand. But you come to work Friday noon. You got to put in a day and a half, no matter how you figure. George looked at him levelly. We're going to stick around a while, he said. Me and Lenny going to roll up a steak. The door opened quietly, and the stable buck put his head in. A lean negro head, lined with pain, the eyes patient. Mr. Slim? Slim took his eyes from old Candy. Huh? Oh. Hello, Crooks. What's the matter? You told me to warm up the tar for the mule's foot. I got to warm. Oh, sure, Crooks. I'll come right out and put it on. I can do it if you want, Mr. Slim. No, I'll come do it myself. He stood up. Crooks said, Mr. Slim? Yeah? That big new guy's messing around your pups out in the barn. Well, he ain't doing no harm. I give him one of the pups. Just thought I'd tell you, said Crooks. He's taking them out of the nest and handling them. That won't do them no good. He won't hurt him, Slim. He won't hurt him, said Slim. I'll come along with you now. George looked up. If that crazy bastard's fooling around too much, just kick him out, Slim. Slim followed the stable, bu stable buck out of the room. George dealt with wit. Ah, it's late in the day, my brain's starting to slip. Let's try this again. George dealt, and Wit picked up his cards and then examined them. See the new kid yet? He asked. What kid? George asked. <laughs> Why, Curly's new wife. Yeah, I seen her. Well, ain't she a Lulu? I ain't seen that much of her, said George. Wit laid down his cards impressively. Well, stick around and keep your eyes open. You'll see plenty. She ain't concealing nothing. I never seen nobody like her. She got the eye going all the time on everybody. I bet she even gives the stable buck the eye. I don't know what the hell she wants. George asked casually. Been any trouble since she got here? It was obvious that Wit was not interested in his cards. He laid his hand down and George scooped it in. George laid out his deliberate, solitaire hand. Seven cards, six on top. Five on top of those. Wit said, I see what you mean. No, nah, there ain't been nothing yet. Curly's got yellow jackets in his drawers, but that's all so far. Every time the guys is around, she shows up. She looking for Curly, or she thought she left something laying around. She looking for it. <laughs> Seems like she can't keep away from guys. And Curly's pants are just crawling with ants. 
But there ain't nothing coming for yet. George said. She's going to make a mess. There's going to be a bad mess about her. She's a jailbait all set on the trigger. That curly got his, cut work, his work cut out for him. Ranch with a bunch of guys on it. No place for a girl. Especially like her. Wit said, If you got ideas, you ought to come into town with us guys tomorrow night. Why? What's doing? <laughs> Just the usual thing. We go into old Susie's place. Hell of a nice place. Old Susie's a laugh. Always cracking jokes. Like she says when we come up on the front porch last Saturday night, Susie opens the door and says over her shoulder, Get your coats on, girls. Here comes the sheriff. <laughs> she never talks dirty, neither. Got five girls there. What's it set you back? George asked. Two and a half. You can get a shot for two bits. Susie got nice chairs to sit in, too. If a guy don't want no flop, he can just sit in a chair and have a couple or three shots and pass the time of day. And so Susie don't give a damn. She ain't rushing guys through and kicking them out if they don't want to flop. I might go in and look the joint over, said George. Sure, come along. It's a hell of a lot of fun. Her cracking jokes all the time. <laughs> like she says one time, she says, I've known people, if they got a rag rug on the floor and a Cupid doll lamp on the phonograph, they think they're running a parlor house. <laughs> That's Clara's house she's talking about. And Susie says, I know what you boys want, she says. My girls is clean, she says. And there ain't no water in my whiskey, she says. If any of you guys want to look at a Cupid doll lamp and take your own chance of getting burned, why, you know where to go. <laughs> and she says, there's guys around here walking bow-legged because they like to look at a Cupid doll lamp. George asked, Clara runs the other house, huh? Yeah, said Wit. We don't never go there. Clara gets three bucks a crack, 35 cents a shot, and she don't crack no jokes. But Susie's place is clean, and she got nice chairs. Don't let no goo-goos in, neither. Me and Lanny are rolling up a steak, said George. I might go in and set and have a shot, but I ain't putting out no two and a half. Well, a guy gotta have fun sometime, said Wit. The door opened, and Lenny and Carlson came in together. Lenny crept to his bunk and sat down, trying not to attract attention. Carlson reached under his bunk and brought out his bag. He didn't look at old Candy, who still faced the wall. Carlson found a little cleaning rod in the back, rod in the bag, and a can of oil. He laid them on his bed, then brought out the pistol, took out the magazine, and snapped the loaded shell from the chamber. Then he fell to cleaning the barrel with the little rod. When the ejector snapped, Candy turned over and looked for a moment at the gun before he turned back to the wall again. Carlson said casually, Curly been in yet? No, said Wit. What's eating on Curly? Carlson squinted down the barrel of his gun. Looking for his old lady. I seen him going round and round outside, Wit said sarcastically. He spends half his time looking for her, and the rest of the time she's looking for him. Curly burst into the room excited, excitedly. Any of you guys seen my wife? He demanded. She ain't been here, said Wit. Curly looked threateningly about the room. Where the hell Slim? Went out in the barn, said George. He was going to put tar on a split hoof. Curly's shoulders dropped and squared. How long go he go? Five, ten minutes. Curly jumped out the door and banged it after him. Wit stood up. <laughs> I guess maybe I'd like to see this, he said. Curly just spoiling her. He wouldn't start for Slim. Curly's handy. Goddamn handy. Got in the finals for the Golden Gloves. He got newspaper clippings about it. He considered. But just the same. You better leave Slim alone. Nobody don't know what Slim can do. Think Slim's with his wife, don't he? Said George. <laughs> Looks like it, Wit said. Of course, Slim ain't. At least, I don't think Slim is. <laughs> but I like to see the fuss if it comes off. Come on, let's go. George said, I'm staying right here. I don't want to get mixed up in nothing. Lenny and me got to make a steak. 
Carlson finished the cleaning of the gun and put it in the bag and pushed the bag under his bunk. I guess I'll go out and look her over, he said. Old Candy lay still, and Lenny, from his bunk, watched George cautiously. When Wit and Carlson were gone, and the door closed after them, George turned to Lenny. What you got on your mind? I ain't done nothing, George. Some says I better not pet them pup so much for a while. Same says it ain't good for them. So I come right in. I been good, George. I could have told you that, said George. Well, I wasn't hurting them none. I just had mine in my lap, petting it. George asked, did you see Slim out in the barn? Sure I did. He told me I better not pet the pup no more. Did you see that girl? You mean Curly's girl? Yeah. Did she come in the barn? No. Anyways, I never seen her. You never seen Slim talking to her? Uh-uh. She ain't been in the barn. Okay, said George. I guess them guys ain't going to see no fight. If there's any fight, Lenny, you keep out of it. I don't want no fights, said Lenny. He got up from his bunk and sat down at the table across from George. Almost automatically, George shuffled the cards and laid out his solitaire hand. He used a deliberate, thoughtful slowness. Lenny reached for a face card and studied it, then turned it upside down and studied it. Both ends the same, he said. George, why is both ends the same? I don't know, said George. It's just the way they make them. What was Slim doing in the barn when you seen him? Sam? Sure. You seen him in the barn and he told you not to pet the pup so much? <gasps> oh, yeah. Yeah, he had the can and tar and the paintbrush. I don't know what for. You sure that girl didn't come in? Like she come in here today? No, she never. <sighs> George sighed. You give me a good whorehouse every time, he said. A guy can go in and get drunk, get everything out of his system all at once, and no messes. And he knows how much is going to set him back. These here jail baits just set on the trigger the host go. Lenny followed his words admiringly and moved his lips a little to keep up. George continued, Do you remember Andy Cushman, Lenny? Went to grammar school? The one that his lady used to make hot cakes for the kids? Lenny asked. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. You can remember anything. If there's anything to eat in it. George looked carefully at the solitaire hand. He put up an ace on his scoring rack and piled a two, three, or four diamonds on it. Andy's in San Quentin right now on account of a tart, said George. All right, we're going to stop there, page 56. So let's just go ahead and do a, a quick reminder of what's going on here. So Carlson says, I do have a gun. I have a Luger. It's a pistol. And he takes Candy's dog out, which uh, he takes out with a thong, which in my experience teaching the story, a lot of people get very confused. And a thong is simply a dog leash. So calm down there, everyone. Carlson takes the dog out, and there's this really, really weird silence, and it's just awkward for everyone, and they're talking about different things. And if you are totally confused about what Wit is saying here, that's okay. It doesn't matter in the slightest. Basically, Wit is talking about going into town to visit, hmm, shall we say, ladies of the night, or to take a stroll through the red light district. But... I'm not going to go into any more detail than that because, frankly, you kids don't need to worry about that. But Wit says, you should come in and have some fun with us. And George says, you know what? No, I might go in and have some whiskey, but I'm saving my money. I have to roll up a steak. We've got to get some money together. So we're here to work. All right. Uh, let's see here. Carlson comes back in. And cleans his gun. Carlson's not a very sensitive dude. 
right in front of Candy. He's like cleaning his gun. And you could just hear the snapping, the snapping of the gun, the taking out of the cartridge, the whoosh, 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 as he's cleaning it. Candy just lost his dog. Carlson's kind of an insensitive guy. They circle back to talking about Curly's wife and how she's got the eye and how she seems to be so flirtatious with everybody. People don't really understand her. And then Curly pops back in and look at the words that are used to describe his actions here. Okay. Um, Curly burst into the room excitedly. Curly was threatening. Curly jumped out the door and banged it after him. This guy Curly, he just, there's so much frantic movement and action around him. Like he's just running around from place to place to place to place. So it's almost comical. We could laugh about it. Wit kind of laughs about it. How he's all looking for her and she's looking for him and he's looking for her and she's looking for him and they're always just crossing paths. Now, it makes me kind of sad. Newlyweds are supposed to just be absolutely thrilled and in love and inseparable. They're married three weeks and they're never even together. So I, I hope for you that someday when you get married, you are so in love that you never want to leave this person's sight. Uh, and, and that does not seem to be the case here. So it kind of makes me a little sad. All right. Lenny comes back. He was in the barn petting the dog. He comes back in and George's like, did you see the girl? Is Slim and the girl like together? And he's no. Who are these people again? George's like, you know, we met them today. Did you see them? No, Lenny never saw them. All right. Um, so let's see here. They're trying to play a game of Euchre. And a Euchre is a game that can be played with multiple people. So uh, why does this detail matter? Well, we can see <clears throat> on page 49, George and Wit sit opposite each other, but George did not shuffle the cards. Eventually, he must have uh, shuffled the cards. But page 51, Wit was not interested in his cards. He laid down his hand. And what did George do? He scooped them up and laid out his solitaire hand. Hmm. What symbolism might these card games have for us? So think about the difference between what solitaire is and what euchre card game for multiple people might represent. I'm not going to answer that right now, but just think about it. All right. And then we're going to end here with this idea of Curly's wife being a tart. You might think of a tart as some sort of special delicious dessert, but no, a tart in this case, we're talking about a flirty woman um, who has the eye. Sorry, I should not have done that. That was probably terrifying. All right, ladies and gents, I think we're going to end there. Uh, and then we will finish the chapter another day. Thank you for your uh, attention. And I hope you are enjoying the story so far. Here we go. Bye-bye.